Hey, this is the last Portuguese you'll hear out of me this week. Pessoal, tem tradução ali, hein? Uh, John, we have a translator there. We have a phone to translate there if you need. Ah. Okay. We're ready. Se alguém precisar, tem tradução ali. Tem aparelho para tradução. Okay, while they're doing that, I will reach into my past and see if I can come up with another story about Linux. I never saw Linux until May of 1994. And I was at this conference, a lot like this one, but the conference was called DECUS for Digital Equipment Corporation. User Society. And there was this person who was supposed to be coming from Europe to talk about this software I had never heard of. I'm proud to say that I funded his trip. And this was the first time that Linus Torvads had ever spoken to an English-speaking audience in English. Linux, and I realized that it was a very good thing. It was good for education. It was good for research, because you had all of the source code available. But I also saw a commercial use of it, that people could actually make money with free software. And I took Linux out onto this boat. It was a steamboat that went up and down the Mississippi River. And I said, Linus, have you ever thought about putting Linux to an alpha processor that my company made? And Linus said, yes, I have thought about doing that. But it's been hard for me to get an alpha. So I may have to do the IBM PowerPC instead. And I knew that this was the wrong answer. So I went back to my office, and I called up a friend of mine. His name was Jim Jackson, and he was in charge of the alpha processors. Now people will tell you in business, the way you get things done is you study the problem. You write a report. You give that to your upper management. They study the report. They balance out all these things, all these decisions. That's not the way it happens. Some of the best decisions that have ever been made, the Apple Mac, the iPhone, other things were, were basically the decision by one people. And what you do, if you're not Steve Jobs, pull in favors. People have done you favors in the past, and now they're going to do you a favor. You've done favors for them, and they do favors for you. And so I called up my friend Jim Jackson, and I said, Jim, you don't know who this person is. You don't know what software I'm about to tell you. But we need to have an alpha processor sent to Helsinki, Finland, tomorrow. Now, today you could buy a nice desktop computer for two to three hundred U.S. dollars. This wasn't true in 1994. A processor cost thirty thousand U.S. dollars, and I was asking him to send this processor to a person he'd never heard of for a project he had never heard of, only on my say so. Me, this is the way that you need to get some things done. I think I'm going to start my talk now because most of the people. Have 
book is called Making Saving Money with Free Software and Open Hardware. In the listing of the program, it said something about how to get rich with free software. That is not the title of this talk. But you can make a good living. You can have a good life with free software. But there is no magic to this. In order to be good with free software and earn a living, you also a good business person. You have to understand how to run business. And we'll get to that in a moment. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I've been in the computing industry since 1969. And I've been a programmer and a systems administrator. I've also worked for some very large companies like IBM, Digital Equipment Corporation, Debt and Life and Casualty. But I've been for some small companies also. I've been a wide range of things. I've been a programmer and a systems administrator. But I've also been a businessman. I've been an educator. And so I have a wide range of knowledge about different subjects. For those of you who come from the Windows world or the Apple world, you might say to yourself, if I give my software away. And the thing is, when we talk about free software, we're talking about the freedom you have you can see the source code and change it to meet your needs. We're not talking about giving away your time and energy as a programmer or a systems administrator. The real core of free software is it allows you to do more in less time because you get to take the software that was built by people who went before you and to use that in solving the problem which you have today. Now, I want you to raise your hands if any of you fit this description. You have a box of software at home attached to the wall with candles on either side, like a shrine. Maybe spotlights shining up on it. Because that box of software is the most wonderful box of software you've ever seen. <laughs> Did you buy that box of software because it was so beautiful? It was such a wonderful product. Or did you buy it to solve a problem? I think you bought it to solve a problem. And even if that problem was playing a game called of Warcraft, it's still the problem that you wanted to have. You were trying to play a game. People do not buy products. And even if you say to yourself, I'm going to, go I'm going to buy a new car, you may think of it as a product, but in reality, you're buying the service Very fast. It's very comfortable, but it's still transportation. So free software is about the freedom you have to make the solution meet your needs. Now, a lot of times I show this slide, and I tell people that every single one of these people made their living from free software. Some of these people are multi-millionaires. They were just like you. College students, people. The, uh, I think we have to turn this down. Yeah, okay, that's better, that's better, okay. I think the translator was not hearing everything I was saying. 
Um, these people all made their living for, by writing free software. And some of them are multi-millionaires. Not all of them. This person right here was running a consulting service out of his house in Soweto, Africa, using dial-up networking because he had no broadband. And he was communicating with Linus Torvalds trying to solve a problem in the AMD computer system. And Linus was writing back to him and they were collaborating. These people were selling service the service of putting together a distribution called Red Hat. The service of helping people make the computer systems do what they want to. The service of creating some free software called Asterisk, which allows people to make voice over IP calls. All of this is service. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So with free software, you have to have a business like any other. You have to know what your audience is. You have to know what the value that you give to your audience is. You have to be able to price that value so that they'll be willing to pay for it. You have to think about things like service level agreements, a contract between yourself and the person who is buying your service. You have to be able to market to the proper people. You have to be able to make the person who's going to be paying you the money recognize the value of the service you have. And you have to make sure that you have enough money to be able to tide you over, to allow your service to be built. If you think about starting a company that you later want to sell, you have to think about what we call an exit strategy. How do you build your business so that eventually you can sell it off for the largest amount of money? On my last slide, the person in the upper right-hand corner was one of the three people that started Red Hat Software. He basically sold it, his share, for about $500 million. So, you have to think about it as a business. Now we ask the question, why then do people write free software? Why do they give it away? And one of the reasons is that they need the software for their own use. Let's say you're a musician and you want to have software that helps you edit your music record your music, play back your music. You also have programming skills. It's natural for you to work on a piece of free software with a group of other people so that you can get software that meets your needs of music. You may not be thinking at the moment, oh, this is software that I'm going to sell or a service I'm going to provide. But as more and more people use your software, you may find that there is a market for that service. And I'll show you what those markets are a little bit later. You may do it because you feel that some other people have written software that you use, and now you're going to write software that helps them. But whatever your reason for writing it, it is because you enjoy doing it. That creates the best free software. The best free software is written by the people who use it themselves. I used to be working for Digital Equipment Corporation, and we had engineers who developed software who never, ever used their own software. And they did not understand why their software was so bad. And finally, I would get them out into the laboratory. i say, can you use this? Can you install this? Can you even make this work? And they said, no. It was terrible. But then why do people pay for free software? 
Because they say, you know, you say, oh, it's free. You don't have to pay for it. But in business, people, in, with business, time is equal to money. The faster you can have something, the faster you can have it done, it's more valuable to you. And so business people will pay a free software person to put in a new feature they need to fix a bug today rather than tomorrow. To be able to make sure that the software is running well on their system. And a lot of the people who work in the kernel these days, people like Stephen Tweedy, people like, well, Linus himself, are paid to write the Linux kernel. A lot of the projects, a lot of the large projects like Mozilla have paid programmers. But you may not be lucky enough to be hired by one of these organizations to be able to be paid to write their software. But you may be a systems administrator working for a company here in Brazil. And you go to your boss, you say, yes, we can buy these proprietary packages and pay a lot of money for them. And then when we need a fix, we can try to get Microsoft to fix it for us. Or we can try to get Oracle to fix it for us. Or we can hire a local programmer to do it. Or I could do it if I have the skills. And so your management starts to think that instead of paying all of this money to Oracle or to Microsoft and see you go outside of Brazil, maybe they should be paying it to you to fix the software and keep it inside of Brazil. This is a big thing in my, for me because I see money more than billions of dollars a year go out of Brazil to programmers who are in the United States. And I, I appreciate that, believe me. But if that money was to stay here in Brazil, you have local people paying local programmers to write local code. And you as a programmer then take that money and you buy local food local housing and you pay local taxes <laughs> but as soon as that money leaves Brazil that cycle stops because there's only so much cachaça that Bill Gates is going to drink <laughs> Balmer probably drinks a lot more so we have people write free software and your management understands that you can leverage you can gain speed of execution by using other people's software. If you go out to SourceForge right now, you will find out that there are over 430,000 software projects that you can pull down and use for free. Databases, data analysis tools, languages of all types, all software, business software, ERP systems, all these you can pull down, but you don't need to use the entire program. If you say to yourself, my SQL has a nice way of searching for something, you can find the code inside of my SQL and pull that out and use it as long as you obey the license that went along with MySQL. And that's typically free. So, you'll hear various companies like Microsoft talk about total cost of ownership. They'll say proprietary software is actually cheaper to own than free software. Yes, proprietary software you may have to pay for, but getting people to support it is cheaper than free software. Because free software, this is Microsoft saying this, free software support people charge more per hour 
than people who support closed source software. And I'm going, okay, Microsoft, let me get this straight. You're saying that if you know how to support free software, you make more money per hour than the people who support closed source software. And Microsoft says, yes. Okay, this is a call to all of you. Now you know what you should be studying, how to support free software. But I don't care whether the total cost of ownership is the same or not, because that's not the issue. The question is, what is the value of the software? After you own it, can it solve your problem? I have a little story. I'll tell it quickly. I'm sitting at my home one day. I go out to the store. I buy a CD of software off the shelf. I pay five reais for it. I take it home. I install it in my machine. It does nothing. The total cost of that, of that software is five reais and an hour of my time. I go back to the same store. I buy another CD, five reais. I install it on my machine. It takes an hour of my time. But instantly, my dog can let itself in and out of the house without me helping it. My wife comes home, kisses me on the cheek, goes into the kitchen, makes a fantastic dinner. And then later, she takes me upstairs to bed, and we make love the entire night. <laughs> Trust me, at the age of 63, that in itself is a miracle. <laughs> then, then, my kids come home from school. They have the, the, the highest grades for the first time in their entire life. And a tax agent calls me up and says, we owe you 300,000 reais. And all of it's because of software on that CD. I submit to you that CD is almost infinitely valuable to me. And I don't care I paid five reais and an hour of my time. If you can change the software to better meet the needs of your customer, then you should be charging them the value that they get from that change, not the cost. As a consultant, I charge $5,000 a day to give people answers to their problems. I work an hour at a time. It's OK. <laughs> it's all right. So people do not want products. They don't want cans of corn on the shelf. They want food. There are some people who like to cook. I hate to cook. I hate to cook, so I go out to a restaurant. And when I go out to the restaurant, I have the food I want. They wash the dishes. They have the wine I like. I like the service of food. Some people like to buy cars. I hate buying cars. Because in New York City, having a car is bad. So I want the service of transportation. The limousine pulls up in front of me. I come down the steps. The driver opens the door. Yes, Mr. Hall, good morning. I get in the back. I start working with my wireless laptop. He's driving through to New York City. We get to where I'm going. I don't have to park the car. That's his job. He drives away. He picks me up when I come out again. It's the service of transportation. That's what I pay for not the car. And so it is with software. You should be charging for the service of software and making the software do what people want. And when I say the word service, people think, oh no, it's like flipping hamburgers, you know, or sweeping the streets. Those are service jobs. No, no. This is a service like a brain surgeon. Brain surgeons do not create a product. You don't end up with a second brain when they get finished. And you don't go to the newspaper and look for the advertisement that says, oh, I do brain surgery cheap. I don't wash my instruments between brain surgery. 
I used last year's CAT scan machine. You don't look for that because your brain is very important to you and you pay the brain surgeon a lot of money. The same thing with lawyers. God knows lawyers don't produce anything useful. But they have a lot of knowledge that keep us out of trouble. And so we pay them for that knowledge. And this is what you should be doing. You're showing your customer the value that you have and you're not just installing packaged products that you can't change, you can't make work any better. You should be charging more for your services. So what is the value of this? What is the value of changing the software to make it work the way it should? In today's world, there are about two billion desktop systems. Let's say that each one of those systems wastes five free eyes worth of time for each person. They have spam, they have viruses, they can't install their software properly, their networking is set up, it's slow. What if you could make that better? What if you could make it so it's only wasting four free eyes or three free eyes a day? If we waste five reais a day, we're wasting ten billion dollars. We're ten billion reais. That's almost enough to fight a small war in Iraq. But if we make it better, we can eliminate that and make, and not only that, but we can make people want to use computers. How many of you like using computers? You like using computers. You are strange. You are very strange because most people do not like using computers. Ask your mother. Ask your father. You know, they hate using computers. They avoid using computers. You know, this thing isn't a computer, it's a phone. They use this, but they don't like using computers. And if we can make it so that they like using computers, they will be better at using them. Now, 80% of all the software written in the world is not written by Microsoft or Oracle or any other closed source person. It's written for specialized applications like embedded systems, like systems administration, like you know, the cloud formations, you know, all that stuff. All that software is written in a specialized manner for specialized problems. And that's where you can make money. So here are the jobs that you can do today if you have closed source software. If you have if you're using Microsoft or Apple, you can do these jobs. You can act as a programmer, systems analyst, product manager, all these things. But you can do every single one of these jobs with free software also. And you can do it better. Because with free software, you can change the package that you've got. You can pull it down and you can change it to meet your needs and the needs of your customer. So this is how you can make money with free software. You can become what we call in the industry a value-added reseller. You can buy hardware components from lots of different people, not just from one vendor. You can mix architectures, Intel, AMD, ARM, you know, PowerPC, to meet whatever the customer's needs are. Using open standards, you can get these things to work together. And then you can charge the money to the customer of what the value of the solution is. Universities should be teaching these things. They should be teaching people how to learn on their own, how to be able to go out and solve new problems. And you can do it on your own through self-training and certification. So I'd like to introduce you, oh, open hardware is the next step of this. 
It used to be, when I started up, a system with 4,000 words of memory, no storage, would cost 150,000 US dollars. But now you can have computers thousands of times faster and more powerful for $35. You can have something like this, the Parallel Board, which is a supercomputer for $99. It has a processor on it which has 16 cores. It has a field programmable gate array and digital signal processing chips for $99. And you can develop solutions that people only dreamed about a couple of years ago. Open hardware, oops, open hardware allows you to develop the entire platform. But yet it also helps with incremental improvement because once you started to manufacture these things and started to create a profit and a cash flow, you could go back and change it again to make it even better. We built a media center strictly off of using a Raspberry Pi, an LCD screen, and a speaker system. And this supplied a complete Debian desktop, as well as access to cloud services, and be able to play your media, all for the addition of a $35 Raspberry Pi. You can also build your own driver circuits, and then control those with the Raspberry Pi, using this to produce the first 10,000 units to get you some profit, to get you some revenue to test the market, and then you can go and redesign it into a cost-productive uh, cost system. So, here are some tips for you in creating your own business. Number one, don't try and do it just by yourself. Get together and form a cooperative, a group of people who have different skills that you can rely on to meet your customers' needs. Number two, study the business models of free and open source software. They're out there on the net. They come through magazines like the Linux Journal and Linux Magazine. They're on the websites of Red Hat and IBM and Hewlett Packard. Study those business models and see how those companies are successful with free software. Try and think of a service or a product which you can duplicate over and over again. Volume is the way of making money. And the more volume you have, the more money you'll make. Advertise. Don't think that just because you're doing a good job that everybody will know about it. There's cheap forms of advertising. Write up what you're doing and put it into the Linux journal or Linux magazine. Get it on a website like, you know, like some of the Linux websites out there. Get yourself known. Come to conferences. Give a talk. One of my friends, Lucas Tesca, was interested in field programmable gate arrays. He gave a talk last year at Campus Party on how to program them. You know, get yourself known. And talk to legislators and legislators in your country to get them to use more free software. Develop something and prototype it. Prototype it, prototype it, show it to people, get them enthusiastic. Start up a, a, a kickoff, a Kickstarter program to get money to build what you need. Like I said, go to the magazines to get case studies. And when you talk to business people, don't talk about the glories of using free software and the wonderfulness. Talk about the two words they understand making money and saving money and talk about don't talk about freedom talk about control and how they have control over their software 
Now I have an advertisement. Actually, two advertisements. If I can get this to work right. There we go. Seven years ago, I started to talk about Project Kawa. Project Kawa is a project I've been working on for seven years to create jobs in Latin America. Instead of creating one company that's going to have millions of people working for it, we decided to create millions of new companies with one person or two people working for them. And we believe that this is a way that you could get started in business and start to make money as, even as a college student or as a single parent. If you have kids at home you have to take care of, you could run this business out of your house. And we had big plans for Project Kawa, but the problem was big plans oftentimes require lots of investment. And we realized it was still too hard to start Project Kawa. So over the years, we went from version 1.0, which is a very big project and very expensive to get started, to version 0.5. Last year it was version 0.1, which was the little media center, and we were getting closer, but we still had some problems. And this year we formulated Project Kawa 0.0. We can't go any lower, folks. But what we're going to do is teach people how to start their own service business and give them the marketing materials, the business plan, the things that are difficult for a technical person to get their head around while the technical person is providing the services to small business. We're in a pilot stage right now. We have a couple of our Project Kawa pilot people out here in the audience. And we're going to be opening this up in the next couple months, putting the information up on the website so that people can start their own businesses. We're not limiting this to only free and open source software. So the people that know Windows will be able to, be, to sell their services with Windows. People that know Apple can sell their services with Apple. But what we are encouraging people to do is when they start new projects, to start using FOSS to do that because we believe that will give you the best chance to give value to your customer. We're going to put documents up on the list, up on this website. What we found is a lot of students say, I don't know enough to sell my services to people. But when they think about it, when they think about all the things that they do with their own computer, all the knowledge they have of their own systems, it's really quite a lot. And it's way more than their business people know. And so what we say is you go out to the business people and say, I will do a backup for you every week. I will get, viruses, get rid of viruses for you. I will filter out spam. I will reinstall software for you so it will work. I will set up a Wi-Fi system for you so that you'll get good throughput. These are things that most of you can do without even thinking about it. But to a business person, small business, they don't know how to do it. And you can make a business out of doing this. One of the key things about this is creating a contract with the business people so they know exactly what they're going to get and you know exactly how much money you're going to make every month. That's what we call a service level agreement and we're going to be publishing that on the web so that you can copy it and change it to meet your needs. You'll be able to put down the times that you wish to do this and arrange for the prices that you wish to charge. We have a small number of entrepreneurs that I have selected. We're testing these materials in the contracts. And then over time, we'll invite the rest of you to join in on this. The time frame is a three month uh, trial of this starting in February. And so by the time we get to May, we should be able to open it up so that anybody can go in and try and run this as a business. One last little advertisement. 
is that tomorrow night at about 2300, I'll be back here on this stage talking about a performance contest that I'm handling for Lanero. And of those of you who are interested in performance of computers and making them run faster and more efficient, please come to that talk. Thank you very much. I don't know if we have any time for any questions or anything, but if we do, I need somebody to help me with the microphone, and I also need an earphone for doing translation because I don't speak Portuguese. But I will also be around for the rest of the week here at Campus, campus Party, so you can also ask your questions then if you want to. I'll ask in English. Uh, do you believe in uh, that in the future, software as a service uh, based on uh, open software will uh, grow up to be uh, at least uh, uh, competitive uh, comparing to closed source software? What I believe is that as the price of computers come down, and more and more people around the world need to have software that works differently for each person or each group of people. It becomes too difficult for some company to manufacture one piece of software that handles all of their needs. And we see this in Microsoft today. They're trying to make one piece of software work on phones and work on, on uh, tablets and work on desktops and in work for different uh, communities around the world that speak different languages. And you, you can't do it. It's too difficult. It costs too much money. They ignore certain markets because they say, we're not interested in it. So what do those people do for software? And I think that what's happening now is the days where software was only used by people who spoke the five major languages of the world who were in the, the first world countries, that day is past. And the only way we can meet the needs of all these different groups of people is by having free software and allowing the people themselves to change it to meet their own needs. Okay, I only can ask one more question because I'm running out of time. Uh, maybe a little off topic here, but uh, what are the odds that a new operating, new completely new operating system, not supported by any major, uh, any major business model, that that it can can be any any successful? Well, that's a that is a very broad question, and the question is: Is the new operating system going to be used as something like embedded systems, where it doesn't really nobody really cares, or are you going to try and meet a general population? that will need general applications. In which case, it may be a new operating system, but it better have compatibility with one of the old ones. Because otherwise, you have the, 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 the classic problem of how do you attract applications to the new operating system, at the same time, generating a complete new set of APIs for it. I mean, Android did it only because Google was behind it. And, you know, and plus they use the Linux kernel, not necessarily, you know, a completely new operating system. I forgot to mention it, but it was a Linux based operating system. That's why I'm planning. Again, it's at what level do you do the programming? What set of APIs do you use? And quite frankly, there's you know, a lot of developers today say, I'm really tired of programming to new APIs. What I want to do is make my code the same across all these platforms, and so to create a, a new level. Compatibility libraries for the old platforms might help with that, but it's really the applications that are the driver. And you have to have a good reason, a good business model for people to go to the new operating system rather than stay with the old one. <laughs>